three, two, one. This is Coffee Talk. What is he doing on the air? Well, it all starts now. I decided to share something that I was going to do in Patreon, but I go, you know what? It doesn't always have to be Christmas to give things out for free and give gifts out. I figured you guys need some something, a little happiness here. Well, let's see what VIP All Access, Coffee Talk, Patreon, what is it all about? It's all going to happen now. As always, kids, don't touch that dial. Just get your cups, fill that mug up. And if you don't have one, you know what? Self-promotion. Links are down below. You could buy one of these at our, at our store. They're really nice, and they keep the coffee warm. It all starts now. It's coffee talk with the tea Howdy, howdy, howdy. Great to see you guys here. Normally what I do, do I do all out recordings and interviews, unedited, uncut, in Patreon. We have a lot of great stuff there, so make sure you check it out. And also, kids, find us the, the podcast. You could download it. iHeartRadio, wherever. Just go. Spotify, it's there. Adika Live and Artist on Records. Two different channels, two different shows, but the same guy. That's right. In the meantime, we're supposed to have a wonderful guest on, but he's supposed to be at 11. He is not here, and I am bringing on if he shows up. Supposed to bring Fritz Coleman. Uh, if you don't know who Fritz Coleman is, he was the weather caster in Los Angeles from 82 to 2020, and he also now has his own podcast show, Media Path Podcast. And I was going to talk about that with him. It's a lot like this show where he'll bring uh, authors, celebrities, musicians, Henry Winkler, he had a lot of cool people on there, even some of the same guests you might have seen here. Um, he had John Sebastian from The Love and Spoonful, which is on our other channel, Artist on Record, which if you don't know about that channel, subscribe to it. It's a lot of fun. Links will be down below. But in the meantime, it is a gr it's always great to see everybody here. Great to see you here. And thank you all for the support and for your super chats. I appreciate it very much. Mwah! Cool. Very cool. Who else is here? What's going on with the other guys out here? Anything special? No. Sorry. There I, he is. I had an outdated version of Chrome uh, stuff, and I'm really apologize for being late. Fritz, don't you worry. We're on. I'm we're the, live uh, on the air. This is like this is this is this is the fans are waiting. <laughs> Hold on, Fritz. Hold on. Do you hear that, Fritz? Look at that. That's the reception I so richly deserve. Don't worry, Fritz. I I I had an. In you know what I did for you, Fritz. Just in case you didn't show up, I had an interview of you. you. You didn't have to be here because this is what I do. Look, rewarding aspect for him has always been and will continue to be oh helping God. others. <laughs> One of the many reasons Fritz is so admired by NBC4 president and general manager Steve Carlston. You are just somebody that gives back to the community all the time. You're great on air. Everybody loves you. But in deep down in my heart, I'll always think of you as the kindest person I've met in this business. NBC4 wow. Vice President of News Renee Washington calls Fritz a legend. This is for sure the end of an era, but the best part about it. Is and he makes us all so much better. How I felt when I started was nauseous, insecure, and absolutely certain that this would not turn into a career. And how I will feel uh, after the 11 o'clock news on the last night is nothing but grateful. You're the face of the station, Fritz. Oh. You want me to weep on camera? Is that what you're going for? This has been a oh. hard week. Oh, sweetie. But I'm going to get you to commit on camera. If we're shorthanded, oh, no problem. you live down the street. No Will you problem. come in? No problem. Thank you. <laughs> You're my friend, and I love you, so I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Yikes is right, huh? That was a, That's a heavy moment, Fritz. Now, here's the deal. I had not watched that since I retired two years ago. Wow. Uh, crazy. Because... When we started at the store, before anybody knew who Andrew Dice Clay was, he was like in the middle of the rundown at night. 
and 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 the dice character was the one he closed with, and it was his biggest laughs. And he would do all these impressions, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, and all these great impressions. But the killer was the end when he did the dice character and just did his whole id. You know, he unloaded his real personality, and that exploded. And then he took good advice. I don't know from Mitzi or from somebody who said, that's what you should be doing your whole show as, develop this character because that's the one that kills. And then he was off to the races. Then you couldn't stop him. And he was the first comedian in history ever to do two nights in a row at Madison Square Garden. Unbelievable. Crazy. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Truly unbelievable. Yeah. So you you were there for the whole heyday of seeing him grow. Into oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so you, so you, you saw the whole, because that's a whole story in itself. The comedy store is so legendary. Yeah. That's a very, it's a, everybody's relationship with a comedy store is very conflicted because some people thought it was haunted. Some people didn't like the energy in there. But if you got on Mitzi's good side and Andrew, it, she, Mitzi, who was the owner of the comedy store in Sunset, uh, if she liked you and saw potential in you, she would be your champion. And she loved Dice and sort of escorted him to the top of his career. Yeah. You know, and, and he was there at the time when Robin Williams was there and Richard Pryor was trying material out for live on the Sunset Strip. And all those guys, Steve Landisberg, and all these wonderful comedians. Uh, uh, Letterman, uh, Leno worked there. And he was also there for the strike, which was a real hairy time there. Wow. When the comics went on strike in the, I think it was like 79, 80. Because up until that point, and people find this hard to believe, they never paid the comics to work at the comedy store. I mean, the owners of these clubs, like the comedy store and the improv, were becoming millionaires, not only from charging a cover charge but you know charging 10 bucks for drinks but they never paid the comics and their feeling was no the comedy store is comedy college it's a gift for you to be able to perform on our stage and have the entirety of the entertainment business see you perform and if you get famous it's because you worked here which is bs you know what i mean you're paying the bus boys and the waitresses and you're not paying the comics 25 bucks and so they had to go on strike to get that done and they did so, wow that's crazy yeah. It was a crazy time. When when did you when did you arrive? I arrived uh, in September of 1980, uh, and uh, I was I was a DJ for 15 years. And I was when you were a DJ back in the 70s and 80s, you would get jobs hosting at various clubs. And, you know, either spinning records or just talking or doing you know wet T-shirt contests or whatever it was. <laughs> so I got a job emceeing at a jazz club a very famous jazz club in LA called, or, uh, Buffalo called the Tralfamador Cafe. All kinds of famous people. Spyro Gyra got their start there. Sarah Vaughn worked there. It was great. And so in a jazz, you know this, you're a new musician. Uh, jazz players are on their own time clock. And although the, uh, the show is advertised to start at eight o'clock, if the, if the band's not ready, you know, they're in the back tuning up, putting new strings on their, mandolin or whatever maybe they don't start at eight o'clock maybe they start at 8 20. well the owner of the club starts the show at eight he's paid he's got people paying a cover charge he's starting the show at eight so purely as a defense mechanism i started to write material for myself so i'd have something to say until the band decided to take the stage 10 15 20 minutes later and i built a little you know mediocre comedy repertoire for myself and i got uh smitten by doing the comedy and i decided to come out here to la to do it back in those days you had to go to the comedy store to get famous every comic that did the tonight show mentioned that they were at the comedy store so i came out here woefully underprepared man i was i was i didn't have the chop. i had like six to ten minutes of good material i got to town really early so i had to do the open mics for a couple of years and finally auditioned for mitzi and got to become what's called a paid regular. And then she would give you a couple of spots a week for $35 a set or some ridiculous amount of money. And that's when I got to know Dice. We were all in the same boat. And uh, it was a wonderful time, but scary. The comedy store had an interesting vibe. There was darkness, there was light, you know, mm -hmm. it was interesting. Yeah, it it does have, it still has that mystique that it when really I went does. in, it, it really Kennedy was convinced they had ghosts in there. And, uh, you know, he, because it used to be Ciro's, the great mafia run nightclub where all the greatest bands in the world would play there. 
And apparently a couple of people were whacked in the back of the comedy store before it came to the comedy store. And they're convinced that the ghosts are still haunting the place. Do you think that you think the place is haunted itself or no? I thought it was haunted, but not because a mafia guy got whacked. I, yeah. I thought it was haunted for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but it does have a crazy vibe of it. I yeah, mean, it now it, it's legendary. I mean, you got Joe oh, yeah. Rogan who who Oh yeah. Is, yeah, his yeah. Name is, is Joe's huge. another one. Joe's another Joe's another part of the comedy store success story. There's so many great um uh people that came out of there. Louis Anderson and Bob Saget and all those guys and Bob Saget, yeah. God rest their soul. David know. Letterman wasn't another. David thing. Letterman was the great MC. He wasn't really that good of a comic, but he could mess with the audience like no other human. He was so fast on his feet with the repartee with the audience. So you great. got to see all that. Yeah. You got to see really. Letterman before he was. I just got there to the end when he got his daytime talk show. And uh, so I got to see those guys you know, on Freddie Prince before he died. And there were, oh, wow. All the guys came to, and Robin Williams. And, uh, you know, I saw, uh, I had a couple of pivotal moments there. Uh, I got to see the first night that Jim Carrey performed on stage. Jim was a Canadian and uh, he was 16 years old, actually too young to be performing there. And the first night, and, and you know, when you work in a room, if you can get the waiters and the waitresses and the and this wait staff and the bus boys to stop and watch you and be engaged by your performance, you know you're doing well. And he, you could hear a pin drop in there. He was so skilled, Jim Carrey, because his pieces weren't necessarily laugh out loud funny. He did these acting pieces that were really brilliant. And we saw him and we said, forget about it. Get out of the way. This dude's on his way to the top. And next thing you know, you know, uh, Ace Ventura happened and he was off to the races. Yeah. And then I saw uh, the night that Mike Nichols and Steven Spielberg auditioned uh, Whoopi Goldberg to do the color purple was in the main room at the comedy store and her opening act was Bobcat Goldthwait. So I got to see Bobcat and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Whoopi for the first time on the night when she was, clear to do the color purple so it was exciting to be there you know yeah. it was now, now let me ask you because on sunset you have the comedy store mm -hmm. and then you had the other right by crescent what was that the laugh factory what yes that's that, that's that right at crescent heights that's uh, which turns into uh uh laurel canyon mm -hmm. going up over the hill and uh that's they do a good job there that's probably I don't want to say that. I, I think it's it's one of the hotter clubs in town right now. Jamie Masada runs that one, and he's got one in Las Vegas and one in Long Beach as well. And he's a good businessman, and that place is pretty hot right now. The comedy store still has a lot of cachet. If guys are getting ready to do a special uh, or, uh, you know, they're showcasing something for the entertainment business, they'll do the main room of the comedy store. It still has that heavy weight in there. And then the improv still works, but I haven't worked there in a long time. Uh, Bud Friedman is no longer alive. That owned the Improv. Yeah, I used to work that place all the time. And uh, but uh, it still cooks. Oh, it's 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 it was all the Improvs were bought by Levity Live, like twenty five clubs, and so it's not the old place where I used to work. But the Comedy Store is still what it used to be. You know, it's still packed. It's, job outside. It's Pretty always great. packed. It's always packed. always packed. And those were the days when when Dice was starting to explode you know it's incredible it's incredible what one guy did from my neighborhood from mm -hmm. brooklyn and just yeah. went back to new york and sold that mass and square garden yeah and that's you know I'll, I'll tell you that that is one of the great triumphs of your life to go back to your hometown the big apple and do two nights at madison square garden i don't know that you can do any better than that and he did it. It was it was amazing. You know, you get everybody on the internet, and you get the the, the the lovers, the haters. Everybody's everybody's a critic behind the keyboards. But you know what? You go do that, and let's see. And you know, it's incredible how he just rocked that place. And it and then you know, the yeah. And then he history. was a victim of cancel culture too. It's so crazy. Yeah, before it was he, cancel you know, culture. Because yeah, look, it's comedy. You know, the stuff he's saying on stage about gays and everything, it's a character. It's the dice man. It's its not his real political theory. But people can't separate the comedy from, you know, the real person and just laugh at it because it releases stress. He really got, I mean, 
who they, they took him down on the internet. I remember, but, you know, because we're in this period of time when we're hyper uh, politically correct and it's hard. And if you're edgy at all, I mean, look at all the trouble Chappelle's been getting into. He's the most brilliant guy working now. And it's, it's all, it's just humorous commentary about life to take the tension out of it. That's all. How do you become a comic these days? You're starting out. You want to be edgy. You want to be different. I mean, you it's in these times. That's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know. I uh, There are a lot of comics now. Although when I started, uh, when I first came out here, uh, the, 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 the comedy club phenomenon was really at its peak. I mean, there were as many comedy clubs in towns as there were Starbucks. I mean, every town in America you would go to, there'd be a Giggles or a Yuck Yucks or a Laugh Stop or something like that. And uh, guys are on the road all the time. This weather job that I had for 40 years presented itself because I was working at the comedy store and the news director from NBC in Los Angeles was in the audience with his wife. And I talked on stage about having done the weather in the Navy, working for Armed Forces Network, but not knowing anything about the weather. And I had like a 10 minute piece about it. He thought it was hysterical. And after the show, he came up and said, listen, uh, do you have any desire to come and do some vacation relief work for me at NBC? Uh, I, ha I need some help with my main weatherman. He has that at a vacation in a year or so. And I and I thought for like a nanosecond because I was making forty five dollars a night at the comedy store. I said, when do you want me to start? And that's how my career started. But back in those days, when we first got out here, there was a comedy club in every town. But the only people that were really making money were the people that had national cachet, the Lenos, the Lettermans, the Freddie Princes, guys, uh, Tom Dreesen, the guys who had had, uh, you know, lots of television exposure. They could four wall the room. But, you know, I was a middle act at best making, you know, you do six nights and make seven hundred dollars, often have to pay for your own transportation and come home with a hundred dollars in your pocket. And I had two kids. I couldn't do that. Look, so anyway, he's, it was he's, he's calling me now. Oh, that's great. <laughs> hold, hold on. Watch Is this. He, please, Watch okay. this. Hold on. Andrew. Yeah. I'm, picking up? I'm picking up now. I'm, I'm recording. I'm with your friend. I'm right now on the air with Fritz. I don't have friends. You have, you have, <laughs> he, he can hear you. He's laughing. He's laughing. I don't have friends. Fritz Coleman. Uh, I don't know, friends with everybody, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. I got a cousin that only wants me to have lots of friends in the world. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, let me ask you something. Do you ever think I went to the mall with friends? Fritz, do you ever go to the mall with, with, with dice? Does, does Fritz know my favorite color? No. Has Fritz he, gone to the movies? With I just me? watched you become Did a hero. Marie with me? No, but Fritz actually said he just watched you become a hero. And and you know what? I, I go I actually love Fritz Coleman. And I don't know if he could hear me, but I got, I I got history with Fritz. He could hear you, you just can't hear him because I'm have you plugged yeah. in. It's amazing. I can't believe you're talking to Fritz. I know, right now. Right and now. He, you know. Is it's been, and I love them. I've been watching them all the years. On you know, in LA. I just told. Uh, I just, by the way, Stephen, I'm not back in New York. Wait, hold on, hold on, Andrew, hold on, hold on. Let me wait. What's that, Fritz? I just told Stefan that you were drunk. a a great. I, can you hear me? He can't no, hear wait, me. hold on, hold on. I can't get you to. Hear, you know what? You can't. The only way you could hear if I brought you on the show because I can't get I can't get my phone to uh to latch on. He could only hear you through speaker. But wait, I'll I'll relay a message. Say th th nice things about me, and I'll hear it later. Yeah, say nice <laughs> things to hear about it later. Okay, let me do this, Andrew. Just, let me talk to Fritz. I love the man. I know you love the you man. You know, did he did he tell you how I tried to used to get on the weather? Oh, <laughs> we didn't get there yet, but we're going to get there. We we're talking about how incredible he saw you you rise and to go back to your hometown to sell out the garden. It's just incredible. He has all respect you. Yeah, but the reason I even got to that level was because I was even pressing him to put me on the weather with him. Is that true, Fritz? No comment. Yes, and the reason I didn't do it is because if he went on there, I would have lost my gig if he would have gotten it. So there's no way I'm doing that. Yeah, he just said the reason he didn't do it because if you would have gotten on there, he would have lost that gig. So there's no way he was going to do it. But, no, 
up, but does he remember how I used to say how funny it would be if he had me come on the weather? And I oh, yeah. Like yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He remembers. Okay, let me finish with him. I will call you back, right. Andrew. Okay? It's just unbelievable how I can't. Love you, guys. You, man, and you do this on purpose to me. Constantly trying to hurt me, constantly trying to one up me, constantly <laughs> trying to get me. I get what you're doing, Frick. I love you. God bless. Love you, brother. I'm so happy to talk to you. I had no idea. He loved you. you. He hung up. He hung up. Yeah, this is funny. Fritz, when we get off the air, I'll get you in touch with him if you okay, want to. Good. I All will right. do that for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so glad you and I got connected. I'm glad oh, you got to come good. on here. This is great. This <laughs> this is funny. Well, that, he does this to me all the time. I actually um, wait, where are we at? I'll tell you about him afterwards. But that was Andrew Dice Clay. Everybody watching, if you got to hear, you got to hear right there, the legend Dice. And uh, I'm here with Fritz Coleman. Let's talk to Fritz. So Fritz was telling us about how he got onto the weather, to be the weather guy from doing a, a skit. So you had no plans of being this weather guy. This is no. exactly what happened. My friend that worked at NBC, I was working there and I had a show on a Friday night. And my friend from NBC that worked, at, he was an anchorman at the television station, said, I'm going to bring my boss and his wife down to see you tonight. You're going to be good. I said, oh, OK, well, come on down. So I comped him in. And, and after the show, this is true. I told a story on stage about working for armed forces, radio and television and doing the weather in the Navy, but not knowing anything about it. And I made a whole joke about that. So when I got off stage, I went and met this guy's boss. And he goes, really, I really enjoyed that. He said, do you have any desire to come and audition to be the weekend weatherman at Channel 4? I really need help with the weather at Channel 4. I said, yes, but I told you, I don't know anything about weather. He said, perfect. There's no weather in California. This will work out great. So I auditioned, got the gig on weekends for two years. Two years later, I was bumped up to the main weekday weatherman. And uh, uh, I, I retired a week and a half shy of my 40th anniversary. It's the greatest Ow. stroke of show business luck in the history of show business. I got to ask you, that woman, you know, was, let me ask you, what made you want to just leave? You mean leave doing the weather or yeah, leave, the, yeah, leave the weather? Uh, no, it was time. It you was know, time. it's a, you got, listen, uh, because of climate change and all these other things, weather's gotten really serious. I mean, they, they hired me to be a comedian. I was like the palate cleanser between the tragedy at the top of the show and the sports. I was just there to, you know, make light. It was California. The weather didn't change between April and October. It was morning clouds and fog, hazy afternoon sun every day from April to October. They just wanted somebody to, to be light and buoyant on the air. Well, that doesn't stand anymore because now the world's collapsing because of climate change. So I just knew it was time for me to uh, step down and let a younger person take over. I have two grandchildren now. I get to see them. And it was, you know, life just tells you when it's time. So your day... Your day your day being a weatherman, it was it was long, huh? You were yeah. What, what was the schedule? Well, yeah, it was it was um, yeah because each weatherman when they were on was responsible for his own broadcast. So I did the five, six, and eleven o'clock news, and so that made oh. me do a split shift. I went to work at noon. I worked till six thirty. I got off the six o'clock news. I came back at nine to do the 11. So it was a 12 hour day with a nice two hour dinner break in between where I could go and have dinner with my kids, do their homework with them and everything. But it's a long day. A long and when day. you get old, that 11 o'clock news will hurt you. Cause I eight o'clock I'm going, <sighs> you know, it's, 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 it's tough. It was, it was awful. So it's, 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 you know, and if you went I, to Trader Joe's, you'd be, you couldn't find parking. <laughs> <laughs> I love Trader Joe's when I can afford it. If that's, that's, that's a hard one to do, but you know what? I notice about you because in New York, I grew up in, in New York and I had like the eyewitness news. You had storm fields. Everybody storm field, New York. Yeah. You had, and, and Frank field before that, or what, his dad, who was his dad? Frank field. I, th right. I think, it, yeah, I think yeah. you're right. And uh, you've had a lot of the, you know, the major guys work in New York. That's the big, uh, the big apple is the big market. The big, but a lot of the weather guys would add like storm or rain, or they have a, a weather. In me. <laughs> you never changed. We it. had a guy. We had a guy out here who's still working. Actually, his name is Dallas Rains. Yes. And people say, "Is that his real name?" I said, "Not only is his real name, his son's name is Austin Rains. So you have <laughs> Dallas and you have Austin, and his daughter's name is something else, another Texas thing. He's a Texas boy, and uh, but he's a good guy. He was like a." Um, 
He's still in the air. He was on 40 years as well. He worked at CNN and then he came out here. And he was like a nationally ranked football quarterback at Florida State. He was a big deal in college football when he worked. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I always wondered about that. I go, did some of these guys just change the name to get like, you know, because I, I know we had another guy called Johnny Mountain. That was not his, I don't know what his real name was. <laughs> the Dallas Reigns was his real name. Which was crazy. People, I remember know. Dallas Reigns very much so, yeah. and and I want and he's one of the guys that triggered me because I would see the storms, I'd see this, I go, yeah. this can't be, this got to be a <laughs> fake name, but it's it's not. No, okay, it's so, I, I, I could talk, I, I could talk to you for a long time. I want to keep I, I don't want to keep your time all day, but I want to I want to push out also Media Please. Path po mm -hmm. podcast that you're doing. Yeah, and right you here, know, I, I appreciate the chance to talk about it. Uh, yeah. Media Path is a podcast that I'm doing with a close friend of mine, Louise Palanker, who's been my friend for about 30 years. We uh, began our relationship because she produced two of my one person shows back at the beginning of my career. And uh, we just saw eye to eye on a lot of stuff. We liked the same movies. We liked the same books. We liked the same music. And then when I retired and I was no longer contractually attached to NBC and I could do independent work. She said, why don't we just do a podcast together and just kind of continue the conversation we have every day as friends and we'll, we'll give it a purpose, which is media path. That is when we come on at the top of every show, we uh, talk about new stuff that's streaming like books and TV shows and movies and just talk about it for five minutes. Then we have a guest and we have all kinds of guests. We, we have some of the same guests you do. Yesterday we had a great guest. Yeah, you seem like old enough to appreciate this. We had the granddaughter of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans on. Oh, wow. She just wrote a book, and it's really cute, and she's very charming. But Roy Rogers was one of the only shows my parents would let me watch when I was a little kid. So it meant something to me. But, I mean, you know, you know how it is. You learn, you have, you have great conversations with interesting people. How, how about on your show, any bad conversations with any anybody? I've had people who... You know this. I don't know why I'm telling you this. People can fall into two categories. The bad ones can be either people who you know they're squeezing you in and they don't really have time to talk to you, but their publicist wants them to do this. And so the answers are short and they're going, pick up the pace. Let's get through this. And the other ones are just people who are just flat, not interesting yeah. and can't string a couple of sentences together. The best kind of uh, a guest for me is to have, I'll, I'll give you an example, Christopher Knight who was on the Brady Bunch, right? And, you know, we know these people as young actors and, what, you know, the cliche about actors is they're superficial and they, you know, they can't talk without a script. This guy turned out to be one of the most interesting conversations I ever had because as it turns out, this guy's a computer genius. And when he retired from the Brady Bunch, he started a computer company and sold it for bazillions of dollars and wow. became a consultant in people setting up computer programs. And it was a fascinating conversation. So the best kind of conversations are when you learn something interesting about somebody you didn't know about. But, you know, the other ones are like pulling teeth where time slows down. But we haven't had that many of those. You know what, Christopher Knight, you made me just think because he also had furniture that he was like on Wayfair Market, like he has his own company. His own line, yeah. The, you know, a very, a very, a very uh, knowledgeable businessman. Very smart. I like him. I like to get. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. And the other kind of guest I love, and the great example of this is people like Christopher and Henry Winkler. Have you ever interviewed Henry? I would love to. Are you kidding me? That's no, a bucket we'll, we'll, list. We'll, we'll get you some email because he has a he has his autobiography out now, so he's went, I'm willing to promote it. I think. I'll you want to hear some funny about Henry? Is my buddy because I was, you know, playing with. Um, rehearsing and the guy I was playing with was from Guns N' Roses at the time. So the owner of Mate's studio, Bobby, his father, Bruna, wrote the character, all the lines, sit on it. He was the writer. For oh my God, days. that's funny. So Henry would, yeah. you know, know. Anyway, Bobby's Henry is maybe the nicest person in show business. Really? And the people I really love, and you probably agree with this being in the music business and working with people who have like global notoriety. I love people who are talented, but they're comfortable in their own skin. They don't have to make you feel uncomfortable or talk down to you. They're just regular folks. And Henry's a great example of that. And those are the other good guests I like to have on there. People who are, they're not trying to impress anybody. They're just having a conversation. That's what it's about, a conversation. You know, I was dabbling, looking at the show. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's its almost like I should just go join their cast and be their partner up there. <laughs> no, you, you know, do a good job. Listen, doing it on your own without a co-host to kind of spell you a little bit is hard. It's a lot of talking. 
And uh, I, I respect to you. You do a good job. I, you know, Fritz, I appreciate that. Now, how could anybody want to give you a hard time coming on the show or give you this much time? You know, do you ever want to tell them I'm Fritz Coleman? Yeah, come on, damn it. What's the matter with you? No. I'm just glad anybody wants to talk. And I appreciate the opportunity to promote the podcast. We're really oh, excited. but I want to share, because I have some notes here. You okay, had a please. couple of, of, you had Peter Noon on, which fabulous. I had him on a long time ago. He is a very entertaining man. I, I couldn't believe how funny he was. He was hysterical. I was shocked having him on. Yeah. And and I didn't, the stories that he was sharing, oh, it yeah. was incredible. And, and you had Pat Boone. Yeah. That's incredible. You know what I had, you know, um, you'll appreciate this. And I'll tell you what why this is very interesting because just last night I watched the documentary about little Richard on Amazon prime. Have you seen that called? I have not, no, I, am I want to see that. You got to watch it. It's brilliant. But you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the blame is that Pat Boone stole little Richard's songs and anglicized them. And it was appropriation of African-American culture. And then I did some research and found out little Richard and Pat Boone were friends. And Pat Boone and Little Richard um, uh, credits Pat Boone with making him wealthy. He said, Pat Boone, doing my songs, gently introduced me to a white audience. And then white audiences suddenly like my music. He said, I owe him more than I can ever tell you. So it wasn't really appropriation. He was really just advertising Little Richard's talent. And it was, a, it was an interesting. And I talked about Pat with that. And he said, 100%. He was very interesting. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. You know, when I was moved to LA the, for fame and fortune, I got a job at a lingerie store on Wilcox <laughs> and Hollywood Boulevard. Playmates, right there, lingerie. It was the best you, job. Man. Was the best job. You're in the well, band. You're time to get in the show business. That's a great way to do well, it. You, you flyer. You, back then, it's when you made flyers and you'd hand it to all the, the strippers that came in. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So there was a post office there, and I'll never forget this. There's a posse coming out, and this is. This has got to be around maybe uh, I moved out here 91, 92. So there's a posse and they're going into the post office. It's little Richard. He's handing out Bibles yeah. with his autograph already stamped. And I and he handed me one. I couldn't believe it. And I, I don't know what I ever did with it. I'm so You know upset. what, though? As a musician and and if you are interested in the history of rock and roll and he 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 claims he is the, you know the architect of rock and roll and the greatest. You got to watch this thing. It's fascinating. I have well, I didn't know. I mean, we always knew he was a flamboyant gay guy, but he used to do like uh he used to do uh drag shows in in Georgia when he was younger, dressed as a woman and singing as a woman on stage, it's fascinating. You got to watch it. Oh, uh, you know what? One of the first movies when I was a kid it was, and it was, I guess they were considered the oldies. It was the early seventies. Let the good times roll. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great movie. But Chuck, mm -hmm. I had the album. I still, cause I'm a big vinyl guy. Chuck Berry's not on the record because he probably didn't want to sell his rights, but you had Chubby <laughs> Checker, Danny and the juniors, little Richard, yeah, little Diddley. Yeah. great album, double. And little Richard was so rock and roll on that yeah they have uh they have talking heads like uh jagger and all these people saying i never i i was like the stoic british band that just stood in front of the microphone and sang and then uh we uh opened for little richard for like a month in britain and he taught me to use the whole stage and take my shirt off and just be myself and it changed everything you got to watch this thing i'm like you know what i will definitely check i love all those stories so you check so so media path i want to I have I put up your trailer here. I'll put, I'm gonna play a little bit for the people watching right now. You guys got to check it out. I'm gonna put the links down below, and uh, I'll get all the right links for everybody who wants to see Media Pep. But here, right here, check this out. Fritz Coleman is a legendary Los Angeles weatherman slash humorist. Louise Blanker is a filmmaker, columnist, and co-founder of Premier Radio Networks. I'm Fritz Coleman. I'm Louise Palanker. And we host the Media Path Podcast, where we become captivated by a given topic. And then we take you along on a scenic back route through books and movies and music, all related to our current obsession. The first 45 record I ever bought was Elvis Presley, Hound Dog, and it scared the crap out of my parents. It was the sound and the rhythm, because this was a Lawrence Welk family. I sort of invaded their ears with this great R&B 
but you know in this new rhythmic music road acceptance in the 50s during the civil rights movement and there probably was something initially primal and sexual about the sound of it that that oh, yeah. the parents found soul always sounded like sex to me it sounded like the sex i wasn't having so <laughs> i wanted to listen to it all the time when you're the Temptations or the Supremes or the Beatles, say for example, and you have a hit record at 18 or 20, it's similar to giving birth to a child because you are now forever the parents of this record. You're the co-parents very publicly, whether you're Frankie Valley by yourself or whether, you know, you're one moody blue, you know, <laughs> on a stage somewhere, you know, at, at age 90. If they don't hear Nights in White Satin, you know, you're not gonna make it to your car alive. Hey, there are five different people. You'd read a, a book That's about cool. Natalie Wood and they- So you do it all. You have it, you have, you have conversations, topics like what you do and interview people. Yeah, and Louise, uh, my co-host, uh, really the inventor of the podcast, um, is a documentary filmmaker. She did a great uh, documentary about the Cowsill family. Remember the Cowsills? The Partridge family, them? which was based yeah, on Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, the Partridge family was based on based, them. Yeah. And uh, she did a documentary about that family that is wonderful. It's on Amazon Prime. It's called A Family Band. And, you know, it's it's... It's if you look for something to compare it to, it's kind of like the Jacksons, where they had this squeaky clean professional veneer they showed the American public. But behind the scenes, there was some stark, dark stuff going on. They had an alcoholic father that was abusive to the wife and the kids. It's a it's a fascinating story, culminating in losses during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. It's a, anyway, so she takes all this stuff and edits them together and post produces the podcast and we put them up on YouTube. So she's, she's in charge of all. So it's kind of what, what I'm doing here by myself, I'm doing these interviews and edit it. And I, I just rolled this out today. Live. I go, you know what? I'm just going to go out live and roll this out to see, to get more views. And then I could edit Absolutely. it. And, Absolutely. And because the editing, I want to pick your brain a little bit while we're here. And this is a lot of, this is, I got to have both of you two on, on the show because I do my other channel artist on record, all music. It's just, mm -hmm. You know, this is more Yenta talk, you know, Yenta, we, <laughs> you know, this channel. But I love the stories that she did that because that's such an interesting story about the councils. A really, really crazy story. Yeah, it that. started out, she was a fan. And then uh, I don't know what happened. She got onto some fan site or something and became interested and found out that one of the councils was performing, doing an acoustic set locally in studio city and went to hear him play and they struck up a friendship and then they were ha having this resurgence where they were doing the happy together tour where all these bands from the yeah. 60s and 70s were going on the road and uh, follow them around and they're they, they they were very honest about their relationships the, between the brother and the sis brothers and the sister and all the, the they were very forthcoming about the darkness in the family and it really made for a compelling documentary. And it's just like the Jackson family where it, 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 it's not what you see on camera. It's the squeaky clean sales job from TV. And then there's the reality of uh, a complicated private life. And it's really wonderful. I just had a wonderful guest on my show, Billy Stanley, stepbrother of Elvis. And that wow. went viral because... One of the fans here, Deb Jackson, she's right here in the chat. She goes, oh, you know, because I have a Patreon. And usually I do these shows. What, what we're doing right now, I do it in Patreon. And everybody watching, shameless plug, join my VIP Patreon. Because if you don't, I'll be living in a tent without any internet service. No, and you no. won't get these great interviews. You like need I'm doing to now. email me all that information so I can help you out. And, and, you, you know what? I when, we, when I shut this broadcast, don't hang up. And then okay. I'll, when I stop recording it's on an air, I'll give okay. you Great. you know information so i had a uh, billy on and my best friend is the drummer for kiss me and him were in a band together he's in kiss now so anyway uh, we talk all the time so i go oh eric you're gonna love this story and, and and gene knows me but but eric is my friend the drummer eric singer so i go elvis listening to kiss for the first time and it's a two-hour interview because we sometimes i only do 25 minutes with people i don't want to waste people's time but if they like you if they want to stay with you Oh, oh I would I would have killed to have been a fly in the wall for that experience. So he tells me the whole story, and then I made a clip. I sent it to Eric, but I go, I go, I have to edit it because I know sometimes Gene might just post it out. So I edited 
kind of really quick, 10 minutes. And then Gene writes back to me email because they're in Rio or wherever they're at, South America, and uh, sends me, do this, do that, take this out. I'm like, okay, whatever. But I kept it unlisted, and all of a sudden I see the views are going up on it. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I looked at his Twitter. He tweet, Gene tweeted it out, and it got me 70K views nice. over in three days. It's still growing. I couldn't wow. believe it. So I thanked him. But the conversation was really incredible. It's Elvis's stepbrother, which uh, there was three brothers, three stepbrothers. His mother, D married Vernon when Elvis was in the army. She met right. him. And uh, the rest is history. And a great, great story. And I'll, I'll introduce you to the Billy. And you'd like to talk to him. He has wow. like, two books that's out. Not, New York Times I, bestseller. You know, and that's the thing we love in our show is the, is the old show business lore, the old show business uh, stories. I just love that. They make Remember Joe Franklin? Remember him? Yeah, of course. I, I, I sometimes I feel like I'm turning into like Joe Franklin, and and I just love. That's all I right. There that. has to be a new Joe Franklin. You're doing a good job. <laughs> well, I'm tr I'm trying for it. So so now, when do you guys air your show? Now we uh, we record them every afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry, every Tuesday afternoon. We do one a week. Every Tuesday afternoon at about three o'clock. It takes her a couple of days to post produce, and then we post them on Thursdays. And then she does a newsletter and there's a lot of, you know, creativity that goes involved that I'm not involved in. So she's but doing it all. She's doing, she's everything. doing the whole damn thing. She has a beautiful pod, a four station podcasting studio in her house. And, uh, she, she does the hard work. I show up at Starbucks on Tuesdays and do my job as her co-host. So you go, you go, you're on the same location. You guys go together and mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. That's it. So all you do, you're, you're just Fritz. That's it. Me. It's a gift to have me there. I'm Fritz. <laughs> That's all you are, Fritz. And then she does all the work. I know. We, we, we both, the, the one thing we're very proud of, honestly, is we all do the research. If we have an author on there, we both read the book. And, uh, you know, when the guests get to trust you and yeah. realize that you're sincere about it, and it's not just the same questions they're asked in a step and repeat line, uh, then they loosen up more and they know that you're interested in there and there'll be a better conversation. Absolutely. You know, and that's the other thing, because how do you separate yourself from all the other podcasts? Everybody's a podcast guy. Uh, that's the problem. You know, uh, that's a great question. Um, in broadcasting, when I was in broadcasting, people obsess over ratings. You have a couple of ratings. You have the overnight ratings. Oh, how do we do on the 11 o'clock news last night? And people get up at five o'clock in the morning to look at those numbers. And then you have the what's it, what are called the sweeps, the rating sweeps. Those are the 30 day periods of ratings four times a year. And that's how they set the advertising rates and all that. And people obsess over that. Mm -hmm. And they parse tenths of a thing. Podcasting is nothing like that. There are 150,000 podcasts in America. And many have it doing the same thing you're doing. You have to just carve yourself out of the pack. And the only way to do that, we have found, uh, without making yourself crazy, is to do the best job you can, play to your strengths, and not worry about how many people are listening. And over time, gradually, you'll notice the number of listeners increase. Now we're getting listens in Europe and every place. And also, and the key to the booking is, and you know this, the uh, the the publicists will begin to trust you with their higher end clients. If a if a client has a great time, like an author has a great time, it gets back to the publicist, then the publicist trusts that you will treat their other people with respect. And it's not just this hacky 45 minute conversation. And then that builds over time. So you just, you, I, I'm retired. I'm not doing this for money. I, I mean, I don't have to. I, I just, I do it because I love the conversation and I love learning things about things I don't know anything about. Yes. So if I just not be competitive about it and just do the best I can within my lane, I find that that's healthier for me. It, absolutely. And I love hearing the, st the stories and just learning about, it, especially about the people we grew up with from anybody yeah. from the 50s, the 60s and 70s. As we are, are getting older, we lose. I have so Felix Cavalieri, the drummer from the Rascals. He's from your neighborhood, right? He's I have Felix. Felix. Ca no, the, the keyboard Felix. The, yeah. Mean, key right. Yeah. yeah he, I had him on the show. I Great. The, right. The keyboards. Yeah. Could yeah. not have been a nicer guy. Nice guy. Just the guy from the neighborhood, you know? And we talked about, and it was all Italian guys in that band and how culturally uh, the Italians uh, had resonated more with R&B and how they had their blue-eyed soul sound, which was, it was the, that's all I cared about in high school. Because I was in Philadelphia, you know, that's all you listen to. 
You listen to black radio and R and B. So the best uh, music. Yeah, it was the best music without question. And so that's how the whole conversation started with Pat Boone and the appropriation thing. And and I didn't say that I didn't like his versions as much as Little Richards or anybody else's, but I, I just talked to him about. It. But anyway, uh, I, I you know when you have people on from our era, like the Rascals were huge in my life. Totally. You, know, you get the interview. Felix was awesome. Oh. Amen. I amen. I'll, I'm going to send you some links to some great shows we did. I actually have a Pat Boone story because I did a corporate party. I was for a short time. I was playing Alice Cooper's corporate parties and we played a golf tournament in uh, Arizona and wow. we did the show and he was hosting it. And it was, you know, because Alice is friends with him. He's so we had this. Too. He's a big golfer. And we had this big suite. I'll never forget it. And I go and, you know, I was like, oh, my good. It was me, the drummer from Kiss. He was out of Kiss. And that's when they got the original guys back. And. Mm -hmm. He was down and out times. So that's why me and him are tight. I'm friends when he was down and out, I call it. And uh, Pat. Nobody works harder than musicians, man. Just No, no. But in this suite, I go, look at this big suite. Then this guy is walking closer to me. And I'm looking. He's wearing a T-shirt. He's wearing black underwear. No, turquoise underwear, black socks. <laughs> it was Pat Boone. <laughs> Fritz. If you had an iPhone picture of that, you could make a million dollars. I got a picture because it was back when he had those camcorders of his golf bag. And I didn't want to be that guy. That, oh, can we take a picture? Because you want to be cool. So I took a picture of the golf bag with the name tag. And I sent it to my mother at the time. I go, Mom, Pat Boone is right. And I go, sir, is this? Is he goes, you guys sound a great at sound check. And he went and watched TV on his side. And there was like a wall you couldn't see. And then I went, I go, it's Pat Boone. True story. True and story. you know, we had him on, and that guy's almost 90 years old now, and he was funny. He's he funny. had great anecdotes about the early days in show business, and uh, I, he was a great surprise. He was so alive, and you would never know his age, and he looks good, too. I was I was blown away. He looks great. Yeah, I was seeing you. Ha you had, um, oh, man, and you had John Sebastian, another he, he legend. Great. What a friendly guy, huh? They're really, really friendly. He can be a cranky old man. If you said something he disagreed with, he wasn't afraid to tell you. Oh. But I love talking to him about the old days in Greenwich Village, where in that folk era, because a couple of weeks after that, we had Melanie on, you yeah. know, the brand new key. And she was at Woodstock when she was 22 years old. But she started in all the Greenwich Village clubs like John Sebastian did. And I always wanted to be part of that because all my favorite comedians like, Cosby and Woody Allen and all those guys all started in those rooms, you know, and I thought, man, that would have been a cool time to be a show business. God, what what a time, man. Man, yeah. that's very, very cool. So, so up and coming, who do you have up and coming on the show? Uh, next week, we have a guy that wrote a biography of a couple of members of the Waltons. Oh, wow. And, and so, you know, we, we love... We find that what resonates with our listeners is baby boomer material, you know, because we're that's just our era, like child stars and early stars in the 70s and 80s and late 60s. And but that seems to resonate. So we have them on. And then I, I honestly don't know who we have after that. We're booked about a month in advance. Wow. You, so you do see, I, I so like. I'll do two weeks, three weeks, and then I start booking. But I have a lot of stuff I have to edit. So I'm like, do you have anybody helping you booking or no? Good for you. Man. Do it all. Yeah, well, my wife's always crazy. yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all myself, but everybody. One day you'll become independently wealthy. And you'll be one one day, Fritz, I got to have you come back here. But everybody watching, because I don't, I don't want to keep you know you so long. I know you're a busy guy, but no but hold on. I want everybody to check out. I'm going to put all links down below for Fritz Media Path Podcast. Very cool. If you like this podcast, you're going to love his. Because Can I plug one other thing while we're here? Absolutely. I'm very proud of this. Yeah. I just did a one-hour comedy special that uh, dropped on Tubi. Tubi is an advertiser-supported free uh, streaming service. Last fr uh, Friday, it's called Unassisted Living. It's about getting older. I, 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 I urge you to watch it. You'll love it. It's on Tubi. Just type in Fritz Coleman, and the thing will pop right up. Wait, tell me, what, what is Tubi now? Tell me what this is. Tubi is a now. streaming service. It's like Hulu or Peacock, where it's advertiser-supported. Not too many ads, but that's how they can make it a free service. And if you have one of the cable services and you and your menu pops up at the bottom of the screen, Tubi is often a box on the left. But you'll it's easy to find, and uh, you'll enjoy it. And I'll get all the links, and I'll put it down here to make it easy for everybody just to click on it. And that's then great. you could pop right above Fritz's head after this is... 
not live, but you'll see if you're watching the repeat, there's going to pop right up there and you'll see a link and you can click on it. But Fritz Coleman, man, thank you for being here. It was a great conversation, man. I, I loved it a lot. And, and having Dice was a great surprise. You know what? We got to do one with Dice on. That would be funny. You that promise you'll come back hurt. on? You'll come back? Say that again? You promise you'll come back? I I, will, I guarantee you I would do it. That Because I'll tell you what, between the two of us, we could have some some interesting memories from the comedy store. <laughs> oh, I, I, there's so many more I wanted to ask you. You saw so many great. He knows more than I do. I think he lived up in Mitzi's house for he a did. while. Yeah. He lived behind up that, that house. Which, I think Sam was living there too. Yeah, they were all, all those guys. Oh, my God. That would be a reality show that it's, you probably it, couldn't broadcast. See, he gets mad at me, Andrew, because he goes, you'll remember everybody else's story, but when I talk to you, forget. I go, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but every, everybody, Fritz, don't go nowhere. Hang on tight. This is Fritz Coleman. Great. Check it out. We'll put the links down below. Everybody, thanks for being in the chat. Um, this was normally going to be VIP Patreon. If you like this, click on, join, subscribe, thumbs up, comment down below. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you didn't like. Until then, you crazy kids. Remember who loves you, baby. We do. Well, we're out of here. It's coffee talk with the tea Nothing rhymes with that.